Alright, so this is going to be an explanatory video on how I built my homemade all-terrain vehicle. I call it the tank for short. It's built almost entirely out of scrap metal and spare parts, with the exceptions being the flat bar and metal used for the tracks, and the bolts holding it all together, and the screws and consumables. But I'll go over all that as I go throughout this build. I'm going to be doing a general overview of how I built it, what it's made out of, and how it works. Right, I'm going to try to stick to a process when explaining this, so hopefully I'll answer any questions that you might have. But if I miss anything, which I'm sure I will, is just because there's so much information to go over, then please, uh, if you have any questions, just ask in comments and I will try my best to get back to you. So I'm going to start from the ground up with the most dominant feature being the tracks. The tracks are built out of 3 8 inch rock crusher conveyor belt. You can see it's just a rubber that's lined with this uh, sort of fiber material to give it extra strength. Like I said, it's 3 8 of an inch thick, which might not seem like much, but considering the rubber's past life, I think it's more than strong enough for what I need. So obviously I couldn't just go with a rubber belt all the way around with holes cut in it because that wouldn't be nearly strong enough. So I made these plates. They're made out of two inch by eighth inch flat bar on top and bottom. And then each other section has these four inch risers to keep it on the bogey wheels, which I'll be getting to a little bit later. They're just welded on and there are 55 track links in total. So these are spaced four inches apart. Like I said, it's two inch flat bar, so I was, when calculating the total length, it just had to be divisible by six, and I was guaranteed to get um, an even spacing between all these all the way around. So originally it only had these two inch angle iron supports on it, or track guides if you will, and those were just not nearly enough to keep it on uh, the bogey wheels, so I ended up going with these. Every other seems to be effective enough. Top and bottom plate are held together with these three eighths inch bolts. I'd be sure to go with either nylock or all metal stop nuts just to make sure they don't go anywhere. Uh, like I said, the track is 26 and a half feet long and a foot wide. I thought that was the minimum I could get away with uh, because I wanted to use the least amount of material possible because every inch added on multiplied by the number around would exponentially increase the cost, which this was built on a very, very small budget. You'll probably notice that as I go throughout this build, but it's functional nonetheless. So you can see I have my front idler here, which is just an old trailer axle that I shortened and it runs the entire length of the front of the vehicle and it's a solid one and three quarter inch by one and three quarter inch uh, square steel axle. So that's really what gives the front end the security and rigidity that it needs. And uh, these were originally a split ring. They're quite old, but they serve just uh, exactly the purpose I need. So I welded them together so there wasn't any movement because obviously any slop in the tracks could be detrimental. So that's about all there is to that. Uh, the three main bogies in the bottom are assembled basically like uh, they would be on a triple axle trailer. I have balancers in between each one and a hanger there, hanger there, hanger there, and hanger there. And the hangers, I would advise if you were to copy me, I would go with uh, something a little bit heavier than quarter inch flat bar. It seems to do the job well enough, especially considering how many there are, and the vehicle doesn't really weigh that much. So this is functional, but if you were to do something a little more sturdy and permanent, I'd recommend using something a little heavier than quarter inch. These are mobile home trailer axles. These were readily available, so this is what I went with. Um, tires are a little old and cracked, but it works. Moving on to the back of the track, this is sort of the, the workhorse of the whole thing. This is the uh, drive sprocket for the whole track. And one important thing that I'm going to mention to take note of, if you ever build anything with tracks, learn from my mistakes. So obviously this follows a curve around the track, and when you cut this out on a flat surface and you leave a four inch gap between this side and this side, you would expect it to also correlate to needing a four inch tooth, but that isn't the case. The track rubber bends along a center midline right along here. So what happens is when you get this curve, these two points are this side of the track. The edges there and there become closer together and you actually end up losing about a quarter of an inch in total. So I had three and three quarters of an inch of a space to fill, not four inches that I cut out. So keep that in mind. You can kind of see, obviously it's uh, slightly obscured by the curve of the tooth here, but you can see the distance there, even though it's touching on the bottom and there. Hopefully that demonstrates what I'm trying to say. Um, the teeth themselves are actually the, the drive line from the pickup truck where all of the drivetrain came from. Cut in half, bent in a little bit to make it the three and three quarters that I needed, and then evenly spaced and welded. The sprocket body itself is made from a steel rim that came with the truck with some sheet metal 
lining it that was cut out from a, a well pressure tank. And that was done simply because I had it on hand and it already had a nice curve to it. So the way I did this is obviously I measured uh, the circumference of the whole wheel, uh, cut it with about two inches to spare, and then wrapped it around with a ratchet strap and got it really tight, tacked it around, welded it. You can see the welds aren't the greatest, but they do hold. And that's all I really care about. And that seemed to do the trick. So just some tips and tricks to help it speed along the process for you if you choose to follow in my footsteps. So hopefully that answers any of the questions about the tracks. As I said, that came from the truck. All this came from a trailer. And this came from a boat trailer. I needed a small idler. Originally, the tracks just sagged. And because the bottom of the tire was moving uh, this direction, top of the tire this way, in the same speed, if this was touching the top of the track and moving along the bottom, moving along the top, it wouldn't have any issues. But uh, I noticed a lot of bounce to the track that I just didn't like because it resulted in some detracking incidences. So. I would recommend adding some kind of tensioner if you were to do this. My original idea was to make the track a perfect length for the tires when they were deflated by half. And then I would simply inflate them, pull it tight. But as you notice, there's still quite a bit of sag. And I think that's just because with all the stretching and tugging of this belt, it was stretched a little bit, but um, seems to do the job. Okay, hopefully that answers any questions you have on the tracks. If you do have any more, please just let me know. I'll go ahead and answer them if I can. So, moving on from that, move to the back of the vehicle, and I'll give you a glimpse into the drivetrain. So, as you can see, this is the standard transmission from the 1992 Dodge Dakota that I scrapped all the parts from to build this and all the working functions. There you can see the engine hooked onto the transmission which is just leading straight into the rear axle of the pickup truck. Obviously I had to shorten the drive line by quite a bit and the rubber mount for the transmission to the support rail was broken on the vehicle when I got it. It was kind of a junker, um, but it was free so I couldn't really complain. And it's just supported with this U-bolt uh, here, keeping it secure, but it's still rubber on rubber so, uh, so vibrations are absorbed. Now rather than go through all the trouble of actually building a engine mount, what I decided to do was take the old truck frame, you know, the parts that mattered, the support parts for the engine uh, and the transmission. Basically, I just cut that part of the rail out of the truck and dropped it straight into this little cradle I made. It runs along here, the other side and up, out of a uh, four inch channel, which is really what all the main structure is constructed of, as you can see. For added support on this piece of the framework here, I inserted a piece of three and a half inch by three eighths inch flat bar, welded it in place just to give the channel some more strength. Because uh, as you can see, this is where the rear axle of the truck, which drives the drive sprockets, is bolted in place. So that's where all the torquing would try to rip that apart. So just as an added safety, I don't want to have to do any repairs if I can avoid them in the future. So as an uh, ounce of prevention, that's why that's there. One question that may have crossed your mind is how do I shift? Unfortunately, I haven't finished the linkage to do that yet. But this is what I had in mind. So it's a manual five-speed transmission. But unfortunately, the vehicle that I was given to build this project with uh, was a five-speed and beggars can't be choosers, so this is what I had to deal with. I removed the shift knob, as you can see, and I built this little carriage around it. There's a rail here and a bearing here and here, and that allows the motion necessary. Up and down and left and right. It's a little stiff. So my uh, idea is to someday add a solenoid between here and here, and between here and here and use an Arduino to control the uh, lever position. But that'll be sometime in the future. I'm not sure yet when I'll get back to this project. But when I do, I'll certainly give you guys an update. The fuel tank I'm using is the original fuel tank from the Dodge Dakota. Mounted here in this cradle made out of three and a half inch by three eighths inch flat bar. And the fuel filter is mounted on the side. And this is an in-tank fuel pump. So it's mounted on the top and these bed pieces are removable with these T-bolts to access everything down there. All of these silver panels that you see are cattle trailer decking panels. They fit together with a lip and a hook on the bottoms. And they really work perfectly for this because they already have the support structure underneath. So I didn't need to do much bracing. Here's my fuel inlet. Simple one and a quarter inch water pipe. No problems whatsoever. Just don't tighten it all the way, otherwise you'll end up creating a vacuum and it won't feed fuel to the system. 
All right, while we're back here, I'll give you guys a glimpse of how I did my steering on this vehicle. I used the original truck brakes in the rear, their uh, drum brake, and simply attached master cylinders for steering up in the front to brake in each side independently using an open differential in the middle. So the way an open differential works is you have a certain RPM going in and then it gets translated through gears to be evenly distributed to both wheels. But obviously when you're in a standard vehicle and you're turning, the outside wheel needs to be moving faster than the inside wheel and so it has a gear assembly in there to divide the speed by both wheels depending on what's needed. So by stopping one side, I'm giving all of its speed to the other side and vice versa. So that's how I chose to do my steering for this vehicle. It was the simple, most straightforward way and most of the parts I needed were already there. As we move to the front of the control section, you can kind of see how the braking system works a little bit more openly here. You've got two simple levers, a right lever and a left lever that engage what are actually clutch master cylinders, but as long as they're generating hydraulic pressure, it really doesn't matter. These are from uh, each from a 1992 Toyota 4Runner, so there's a little bit of everything in this vehicle, as you'll see, and I'll try to give you a complete list of every machine in this thing, and I think you guys will get quite a kick out of it. So I wanted this thing to be somewhat modular because I wasn't sure if this configuration would be a permanent solution. So uh, I built this frame out of some one and a quarter inch by eighth inch angle iron made from old, I believe they were building pieces for like a, a quick put together structure that I was given. Uh, you can see a lot of the, the framework is made out of that simply because I had so much of it given to me. As far as controls go, there really isn't much needed. I have a simple fuel pump switch and a keyed ignition. Unfortunately, I did lose the key, right? Go figure. So right now it has this remote start button hooked up to it, but it works just as well. It's not like anybody's gonna steal this thing. This is the original gas pedal from the Dodge Dakota. As you can see, it's just pulling on a cable, which is run through this quarter inch tube all the way around the frame, back up. And if we peer into the side access panel see it goes around here and all the way to the throttle low tech but very effective as far as the engine goes it's a 3.9 liter v6 originally it had about 180 horsepower but i doubt if it's half that now this engine has seen better days but it more than suits my needs so i'm not going to complain and so far i've had no issues with it the truck, when it came in, did have some minor issues that needed to be fixed. Uh, there was a hole in the radiator, you can see there. That was a quick solder job. Also, you'll notice that the radiator is at a very odd place, but unfortunately with the placement of the engine, that's just the best place for it to be, and I haven't had any overheating issues with it so far. It seems I can get uh, plenty of airflow, and there's a lot of open space around it, so I haven't had any issues, like I said. And because we, it's, it is a manual transmission, we have the clutch pedal here, which is hooked up to the, actually, uh, it's kind of ironic, I use the clutch master cylinders from a different vehicle to steer, aka brake, and I use the brake master cylinder for the clutch, but it's what I had, and we make do. So the brake cylinder, aka clutch cylinder, line runs all along here, along this rail, where it was heated, and then poked into the plastic line down there. Not exactly sure what material it is, but originally it was a closed system uh, between the master cylinder and slave cylinder, so I had to jerry-rig that a little bit, but actually no leaks, surprisingly. Now you'll notice there is no battery compartment yet, so I just have this battery sitting in the cab with jumper cables leading to the positive and negative terminals. Unfortunately, I was on quite a tight schedule to get this finished, so I didn't have time to add a battery holder in underneath the hood, but as far as functionality goes, there's nothing wrong with this setup as, as, as it sits. So I think that's most of the technical stuff. Now I'm going to move on to just basic appearance and dimensions. It's 74 and a half inches wide. So from the outside of the fender to the outside of the fender, it's 69 inches tall and it is almost exactly 14 feet long. Now you might see some similarities in design. I sort of halfway modeled it after the Ripsaw EV1, which Ripsaw is a line of vehicles produced by a company called How & How Tech, currently the world's fastest track vehicle. So obviously that was sort of instrumental in designing the whole thing. I did a few touches of my own, obviously. And it's much lower quality, <laughs> to be completely honest. All of the skin, all this here, this is made from, uh, it was laminated on sheets of plywood for horse stalls and so uh, 
I heated it, delaminated it, and used it for just the body construction. It's quite thin, but it's more than enough. Again, this has been kind of a short video overview on this thing. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any more questions, because I'm sure I missed something along the way, then please feel free to comment. And I promise that I'll at least try to get back to you guys. Now, I just recently started thinking about starting up a YouTube channel where I document the processes on building things like this. I wouldn't be opposed to maybe doing a version 2 someday. So if you were interested in this and you wanted to see a complete start to finish series on building a higher quality one out of better materials, show support and let me know. And if you'd like to see more projects like this or larger scale, hopefully enjoyable, fun things that are totally impractical and over the top, then consider supporting my YouTube channel. This is going to be the first video, so hopefully only up from here.